When you hear the word pressure, what do you think of? Do you think of gas pressure? Do you think of a force? What comes to mind? Pressure is defined as force divided by area. So imagine if we have this rectangular area, and if we apply a force throughout the surface of that area, that force will exert a pressure throughout that area. Now there's two ways in which you can increase the pressure. You can increase the force, or you could decrease the area. Pressure and force are directly related. Area and pressure are inversely related. So imagine if someone pushes you with their hand softly. They will exert a pressure on you, but it's not going to be that large. Now, if they increase the force and push on you with a much larger force, you're going to feel an increased pressure. Now, another way in which they can increase the pressure is imagine if they take a, a pen and if they poke you but softly with a pen. Even if, if they poke you softly, you're going to feel it. Sometimes it might feel like a sharp pain because the area of the tip of the pen is so small that the pressure increases greatly and your body picks up that pressure and it's like, hey man, stop doing that. So those are two ways in which you can increase the pressure. You can increase it by increasing the force or by decreasing the area. So imagine if we have a textbook that's laid on this surface. Let me draw a textbook. And let's say the mass of the textbook is 5 kilograms. And the measurements of the textbook are 20 centimeters by 40 centimeters. Now this textbook is going to exert a downward weight force on the table. So what is the pressure exerted by the book on the table? How can we calculate that pressure? Now it's important to understand that the weight of the object exerts the downward force. And weight in physics is mass times gravitational acceleration. So the force is mg. So that's going to be 5 kilograms times the gravitational acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So 5 times 9.8 will give you a force of 49 newtons. Now before we can find the pressure, the next thing we need to calculate is the area. The area is length times width. And now we want it in a standard unit of meters. 100 centimeters is equal to 1 meter. So if you want to convert centimeters into a meter, you need to divide by 100. So 20 centimeters is equivalent to 0.2 meters. And 40 centimeters is equivalent to 0.4 meters. So what's 0.2 times 0.4? Well, 2 times 4 is 8. But 0.2 times 0.4 is going to be 0 0.08. So the area is 0 0.08 square meters. So now that we have the area and the force, we can now use this equation to calculate the pressure. So we have a force of 49 newtons being exerted over an area of 0 0.08 square meters. So 49 divided by 0 0.08 is 612.5 newtons per square meter. So that's the pressure. So what does that number mean? So what does it mean to have a pressure of 612.5 newtons per square meter. So this means that if you exert a force of 612.5 newtons over an area of one square meter, you're going to have the same exact pressure. Now you need to know that one newton per square meter is equivalent to a pascal. In physics, the common pressure unit is pascals and kilopascals, but this is the standard pressure unit. In chemistry, you're going to encounter units such as ATM, Tor, and millimeters of mercury. You need to know that one kilopascal is equivalent to a thousand pascals. And 101.3 kilopascals is one ATM. That's one atmospheric pressure. This is the pressure at sea level. 
Now, 1 ATM is equal to 760 Tor, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So those are some units that you want to be familiar with when dealing with pressure. Now, something that you need to know is that the atmospheric pressure is dependent upon elevation. So as the elevation increases, the atmospheric pressure decreases. So let me draw a picture that's going to illustrate that. So let's say if here we have the shape of a mountain. And here is a valley. And let's say this is the sea. So the atmospheric pressure at sea level, I'm just going to put P, is 1 atm. Now, as you increase the elevation, as you go higher, let's say to the top of the mountain, the pressure might be much less. It might be 0.6 atm. Now, if you go below sea level, let's say at a valley, the pressure is going to be larger than 1 atm. It might be 1.3 or 1.4 atm, depending on how deep you go. Now, if you go deep, deep down inside a cave, the pressure is going to be even higher. So the pressure is dependent upon elevation. But in chemistry, the most common pressure that you're going to deal with is the pressure at sea level. But just know that as you go higher, the pressure decreases. And as you go lower, the pressure increases. So let's say if you want to boil water. Boiling water, the temperature at which water boils is dependent on the atmospheric pressure. At sea level, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. But at the top of the mountain, the boiling point will decrease. So at a pressure of 0.6 atm, the boiling point of water is going to be around 86 degrees Celsius. Now, if you go down to a valley where the pressure is higher, the boiling point is going to be higher as well the boiling point at this pressure will be around 108 degrees Celsius. And so it's a lot easier to boil water at the top of a mountain. But deep in a valley or below a cave, if you dig deep into the earth, it's going to be a lot harder to boil water. It's going to require more energy. So as the elevation increases, the atmospheric pressure decreases, and the boiling point of water or of any fluid will decrease as well. So here's a question for you. Why is it that the pressure at the top of a mountain is less than the pressure at sea level? We know it happens, but why does it happen? Now think back to the example with the book resting on the table. The book exerts a downward weight force. And that weight force is dependent on the mass of the book. So the book has atoms inside of it, and every type of atom that we know of contains mass, which exerts a downward weight force because of gravity. And pressure is going to be force over area. So every type of object will exert a downward weight force, and if you divide it by the area, every object will exert a pressure. So let's say if we have a column of air. In this column of air, there's going to be molecules. And these molecules are bouncing all around, and they consist of matter, which means that all of these molecules exert a downward weight force. So the more molecules that you have, the more mass there will be present, and so the greater the weight force will be. So these molecules exert a weight force over a certain area, so therefore they exert a pressure. Now let's say this is sea level. The pressure at this point will be 1 atm because you have the weight of all of these molecules exerting a downward force on this surface. Now let's say if we increase the elevation like we're going to the top of a mountain. At this level there's less gas molecules above that point. And so the pressure is going to be lower. It might be 0.6 atm at that point. 
And if we go higher up, if we increase the elevation, the pressure is going to be even less because there's less molecules up here. And so that's why the pressure at the top of a mountain is much less than the pressure at sea level because there's less air molecules at the top of the mountain. So as you increase the elevation, you have less molecules, which means that there's less mass, so they exert a lower weight force. And if you decrease the force, the pressure will decrease. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, if we go back to the picture that we had before with the mountain and the valley and the sea, I'm going to draw a column of air molecules. And let's say this is basically the end of the atmosphere. So beyond this point, we'll call it outer space. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack a single column of air molecules up to the outer space line. Because in outer space, there's virtually no air molecules. If there is, it's very, 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 very small. It's almost zero. So right now, between outer space and sea level, I have 10 molecules stacked together. Let's say they're identical molecules. And the pressure at sea level is 1 atm, which correlates to the weight of those 10 molecules. Now, let's say at the top of the mountain, I can only stack five molecules. So clearly, this is going to have twice the weight of the five molecules because you have 10 molecules. And so the pressure will be two times as greater. So the pressure at the mountain will be 0.5 because you have half the weight compared to the weight that we have here. So we have half the number of molecules. So as you increase the elevation, there is less air molecules above this point, and so the pressure at that point is less. Now at the valley, I can stack more air molecules. So I counted 18. So the pressure here will be 1.8. Every molecule represents a pressure of 0.1 atm. And that's why the pressure is so much higher below sea level, because there's more air molecules above that point. And so the weight of the air molecules is greater. And if you increase the weight force, you can increase the pressure. Now, in air, air is mostly composed of nitrogen. It's 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. The last percent consists of other gases. You might have argon, carbon dioxide, helium, and some other trace gases. And depending on the temperature, sometimes you have water vapor in the air as well. Now, let's say if you have a column of gas molecules. Where will these gas molecules be present if you have a very, very tall column? What you need to understand is that heavy gas molecules, they tend to sink down. Lighter gas molecules tend to rise to the top of the column. So nitrogen has a molar mass of 28 grams per mole. The molar mass of oxygen is about 32. Argon is roughly 40. CO2 is 44. Helium is about 4. And water is about 18. So if you ever put helium inside a balloon, you'll know that helium, the helium balloon, tends to rise. It tends to go up. And so helium tends to rise to the top of the atmosphere because it's a lighter gas. Heavy gases like carbon dioxide and argon, they tend to sink to the bottom. Let's say if you have a table and you place some dry ice on this table. Dry ice is basically solid carbon dioxide. And due to the warmth of the table, the ice will not remain. Now, the reason why it's called dry ice is because it doesn't melt into a liquid. Rather, it goes directly from the solid phase to a gas phase. And this is called sublimation. 
when a substance skips the liquid phase. It goes directly from solid to gas. And if you know this, if you ever place dry ice on a table, you'll see like a, a cloud vapor that will sink to the bottom. Carbon dioxide is a heavy gas, and it tends to sink to the bottom. Also, sometimes the cloud of vapor that you see is not just CO2 because CO2 is invisible. And so what it does is, because it's so cold, it can condense water vapor in the air. And cold air is heavier than warm air. So cold air tends to sink, hot air tends to rise. So when you have cold water vapor, it will sink, along with the CO2 that you can't see. But heavy gases like carbon dioxide will sink to the bottom. But if you ever watch dry ice, if you maybe go to a YouTube video and look at dry ice, you'll never see it rise up. It always sinks down. And it seeps towards the ground. Now, let's say if you had a pot with some water inside of it. And let's say you boil the water. You'll notice that the steam that's produced, the water vapor that comes out of it, it's going to rise. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is that warm air, as we mentioned, tends to rise. Cold air tends to sink. So when you have hot steam coming out of the pot, it's going to go up because it's warmer than the surrounding air. Warmer air tends to be less dense than colder air. Colder air, it's more dense, so it tends to sink. Warm air tends to rise. The second reason is the weight of water compared to nitrogen and oxygen. Water is lighter than N2 and O2. So as a result, because it's lighter, it's easier for it to rise. Since air is mostly composed of nitrogen and oxygen, the average molar mass of air is somewhere between 28 and 32. Since there's a lot more nitrogen gas than oxygen, the average molar mass of air should be closer to 28 than 32. So it might be like 29 or something. And since water is lighter than the average weight of air, it's easy for water, water vapor to rise. But helium, it's a lot easier for it to rise. You don't have to heat up helium. If you put a helium inside a balloon, you'll see that automatically it will rise regardless of temperature. And that's because helium is so light compared to uh, the gases that compose of air, like nitrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen gas will do the same thing. If you put hydrogen gas in a balloon, it will rise too, but the problem with hydrogen gas is it's flammable. If you ignite a spark between hydrogen and oxygen, it will produce H2O. And these two gases, they tend to react violently with each other in order to produce a stable compound like water. So putting hydrogen gas in a balloon is not a good idea. Even though it will rise, but it's not the, the smartest thing to do. Nowadays, if you want to lift up an object with a hot air balloon, you just need to use heat. If you apply heat to the gases inside the balloon, in this case air, the air inside the balloon is going to be warmer than the air outside. And as a result, the balloon will exert a lift force that's going to lift the object up. So as you heat the air, it's going to rise. But as the air cools down, the weight of this object and the entire balloon will bring it down. So you ever seen those movies with a hot air balloon? When you turn on the fire, it goes up. And if you turn off the fire, eventually it'll fall down. And so you can adjust the height based on if you want to go up or down. Just increase the temperature if you want to go up, cool it down if you want to go down. Now here's a question for you. So let's say we have a mountain and we have the ocean. And let's say we put helium inside a balloon. What's going to happen to the balloon as it rises? So we know helium is lighter than air. So it's going to have a net upward lift force that's going to lift it up. And let's say this is outer space. So as the balloon begins to rise, what's going to happen to it? Now keep in mind, at sea level, 
the pressure of helium inside the balloon is going to be about 1 atm. But now, when it reaches a higher position, a higher elevation, the size of the balloon is going to change. Do you think the balloon is going to be bigger or smaller as it goes up towards the upper atmosphere? The balloon is going to get bigger. And the reason why that happens is because the pressure is no longer the same. Now, let's see if I kept the balloon the same size at a higher elevation. The pressure will be 1 atm on the inside of the balloon. On the outside, it's going to be maybe a little bit less, like 0.5 atm. So now if you think about it, you have a higher pressure on the inside, a lower pressure on the outside. What's going to happen? Well, whenever there's a pressure, there's a force being exerted. Because the pressure on the inside exceeds the pressure on the outside, the force on the inside is going to be greater than the force that the gas on the outside exerts on the balloon. And so if the force on the inside is greater, what's going to happen is the balloon is going to expand. And it's going to expand until the inside pressure is equal to the outside pressure. So until they're both 0.5. Whenever you increase the volume, the pressure decreases. And this is the main concept behind Boyle's Law. So as the balloon gets higher and higher, it's going to get, to get bigger. So let's say if it's close towards outer space, where the atmospheric pressure is 0.1, the volume is going to increase until the inside pressure equals the outside pressure. And so as the balloon begins to rise, it's going to expand. And at some point, the balloon will burst, depending on the strength of the elastic material that that's part of the balloon. So make sure you understand that. As the balloon rises, the elevation increases, the pressure decreases, so the balloon will expand to decrease its internal pressure so that the inside pressure matches the outside pressure. So basically, the balloon gets bigger as it goes up until it pops.